This is Lecture 5, Novelty Requirement 1. The agenda for the lecture uh, begins with a quick introduction to the American Events Act, which was passed in 2011 and has uh, several significant statutory changes that relate to novelty. So we'll begin with that. And then we'll go into the basics of novelty and anticipation, what we mean by novelty and, and its counterpart anticipation. And then we'll start talking about some of the statutory language and the way that the courts have interpreted that and, and start with known or used by others, move on to patented or described in a printed publication, and then finally wrap up with a look at uh, what is known in the field as secret prior art uh, under the novelty statutes. So first, let's start with the American Events Act. All right. So this was uh, enacted September 16, 2011, uh, so a little over a year ago, year and a few months. Um, this was the product of uh, maybe 10 years of negotiations in Congress. Many bills uh, presented lots of congressional hearings and debate on it. Um, the final uh, bill is the product, as you might imagine, uh, of a lot of compromise between a number of stakeholders. Um, I think most people would agree it does less than had originally been intended when this patent reform process got started many years ago, uh, but it is significant and it does change a fair amount of the law. So the important pieces and the pieces we're most going to focus on in this course are as follows. So uh, Section 112 and Section 282 uh, eliminate the best mode requirement as a defense to infringement. It doesn't eliminate the best mode requirement as we've discussed, but it eliminates it as a defense to the infringement uh, activities of, of somebody else. Um, Section 102 is altered uh, significantly, and this is probably where the most significant changes are, uh, and that's what we'll be digging into today. Uh, to change uh, the U.S. system primarily to a what we would describe as a first inventor to file system rather than first inventor system. Um, and we'll, we will obviously be digging into that in some detail. Um, that applies to all patents applied on or after March 16, 2013. So that's happening. That transition to this first to file system is happening now uh, and will be in place uh, for all patents that get filed after March. Uh, the next piece uh, in sections 300 uh, and thereabouts is a new system of what is described as post-grant review. The idea here is to create an administrative review process whereby patents that have been granted by the patent office can be reviewed um, by a special board within the patent office uh, designed and dedicated to this purpose. Um, the idea the idea here is that this should uh, take the place of some litigation, right? Rather than standing, rather than having to go to a court to receive a judgment about whether a patent is valid or not, uh, you can go to the patent office and seek um, clarification on patent rights uh, through an administrative process. The idea here being it should reduce litigation costs, maybe reduce disputes, um, take some of the, the litigation out of the courts, and and move it into an administrative body. And then another thing we're going to talk about, and we'll start a little bit today, is a defense, a new defense to infringement uh, called the prior commercial use uh, defense. Uh, and so um, that, that suggests that people who have prior uses of something that is later claimed in a patent uh, can, in some circumstances, claim a defense for it if it's been used, if they themselves have used it uh, in an uh, internal process. But we'll talk about that a little more. But these are the big issues, the big changes that we're going to discuss um, in this course. There are a number of other changes. Most of them are smaller in magnitude uh, and, um, and so forth. So what we're going to really start focusing on, obviously, today is Section 102, uh, which changes a lot of the uh, novelty and priority aspects of the patent system. But let's dive into what novelty and anticipation is all about. Um, so backing up, uh, we are looking at standards for patentability. Uh, we've already done Section 112, that a patent must be fully and appropriately described. And now we're diving into uh, patents must be novel. Uh, and we will do the rest of the, this list here uh, later in the course. So let's look at 102. Right? So the way this is going to have to work uh, this semester is actually for a long time, 
uh, is we're going to have to look at two different statutes, right? All patents filed until March 16th, 2013, um, get the 102 that's on the left side here. All patents that are filed after, on or after March 16th, 2013, uh, get the, the 102 that's on the right side here. Um, so given that, that patent terms are 20 years from the date of filing, that means that the old patent law, the, the one on the left side there, is going to be uh, in force and have application to a lot of patents for at least 20 years. Um, uh, at the same time, uh, very shortly, reasonably shortly, probably within six to eight months after March 16, 2013, we'll start to see some patents being granted uh, that are subject to the new 102. Right, so for that reason, I'm going to teach you both, and we're going to talk about some of the differences. Uh, in particular, uh, I want to point out one very important difference right off the bat, and that is the old law, the one on the left, um, talks about a key date. The key date for novelty, and under Section 102, uh, is uh, the invention date, the invention of the the patent, uh, the the invention of the invention, meaning what's claimed in the claims. Um, is is our key date. The new patent law does not use the invention date as a critical date. What it uses is what is described as the effective filing date of the application. This is part of um, shifting the United States to a, a first to file system where the key date for measuring a, a lot of aspects of patentability is going to change from invention date um, to the date of filing. Uh, and so that, I think if there's one thing you take away is that that's a big difference, right? So the, the date you're going to use for as your critical date in a lot of these calculations is going to change uh, as a result of this change in the law as of March 16th. So again, the key date for novelty is the date of invention. Uh, after March 16th, uh, the key date for novelty is going to be the effective filing date. There's exceptions to it. We'll talk about that um, uh, throughout, uh, including a one-year grace period. So it's not purely a first-to-file system uh, that we're going to have after March 16th. There are a fair number of exceptions, all of which generally uh, gives very strong incentives for patentees to disclose their inventions early. Uh, but we'll talk about that later. The key thing to know for now is, is the difference between these uh, measurement dates. What do we mean by an effective filing date? Well, uh, Section 102 describe well the Section uh, 102 describes what an effective filing date is, and it is uh, a um, uh, an effective filing date is the actual filing date, that is the date that the Patent Office receives your application, or it's the filing date of the earliest application for which the patent application is entitled um, given priority rules, right? So the, we've talked about this briefly before, but you can claim priority uh, and thereby get an earlier date. So if I uh, file a patent application today, I can in some cases claim the pa a, a date, a priority date for purposes of calculating uh, prior art among other things. Uh, an earlier priority date based upon an earlier filed application that I have made. Now the important thing is that earlier filed application has to have enough disclosure in it to support my later filed application, right? I can't just pick a random patent application that I've filed before and decide that's the date I want. I have to make sure uh, that it includes enough disclosure in it to support any claims I want to make, right? And how do we measure whether there's enough disclosure? Well, we use the 112 rules, right? So um, when uh, 102, well, when the Part B here of what I've got up on the on the slide says the filing date uh, as to a right of priority under 119, 365, or an earlier filing date under 120, 121, or 365. 119 deals with allowing priorities uh, dates to be given to prior foreign filed applications. So if you file an application for a patent overseas, you can within one year you file here, you can get the benefit of that earlier date. Um, sections 120 and 21 deal with prior U.S. applications. Uh, as long as those applications are co-pending 
um, meaning you haven't abandoned it or the patent hasn't been granted on the earlier one, you can uh, file, you can claim priority to the earlier date. Um, 365 deals with the same as the, the 119, 120, 121, except for it deals with a different process, the PCT, Patent Cooperation Treaty Applications. Um, this is a application process whereby a patentee can file a single Inter, what is called an international application and receive potentially receive patents uh, in, in a number of member countries, I believe around 26 these days. Um, basically the same rules apply uh, for patentability. It's a different set of the uh, different part of the statute, but we're not going to cover PCT very much. We're going to go with the basic rules. Um, so just know that when they're talking about it here, when they, we talk about effective filing date, that means either your real filing date or the earliest filing date to which you are entitled uh, given the earlier disclosure that you have. All right, so again, that's the key thing to remember is that the key date for novelty uh, pre-March uh, 16th is the date of invention. After March 16th, it's the effective filing date. All right, All right so I want to introduce now the concept of anticipation. All right, so a claim that, that fails for novelty purposes uh, is what we call anticipated, right? And and um, there is really a two-step process for figuring out anticipation. The first is to interpret the claim, right? Obviously, you can't figure out what's going on at all until you interpret the claim. And step two is to consider e the content of each piece of prior art. What do, what is prior art? Well, that's part of what we're going to talk about in this class. Is those references uh, that are good prior art that have come before either the invention date here uh, pre March 16th or um, before the effective filing date right that's prior art um, and so uh, to be anticipated all elements of the claim have to be found in a single reference this is what we call the identity requirement um, and a description sufficient to enable the claim uh, is required as well, so in a, the anticipatory enablement requirement. All right, so this is saying that basically the idea of anticipation is you can't get a patent uh, if what you're trying to get a patent on has already been disclosed to the world. Right, if the world already knows, uh, meaning your whole patent claim is found in a single prior art reference and the disclosure in that prior art reference is sufficient to enable you're done. You don't get a patent for uh, that invention. Uh, and again, the idea behind the, the novelty requirement is very straightforward, which is we don't want to give patents out to people uh, for um, things that are already exist. Uh, if the public already has access to this innovation, to this knowledge, then don't give a patent for it. And that's what the novelty requirement tries um, to enforce. So let's look at the first case I had you do. Atlas powder case dealt with uh, uh, explosives. Um, and so this is, there's no real dispute here about the, the claim uh, uh, interpretation um, and uh, except for, for most of it, right? So the, the composition of the claim, uh, you can see in the green boxes there. And then there are two pieces of prior art uh, that the district court had found to be um, each a anticipating reference. And you can see that all of the pieces of the prior art are, um, uh, are in the invention, right? So the invention doesn't seem, see these overlapping ranges, the invention doesn't seem to add anything significant um, to the prior art uh, in any way. So um, something to, uh, so the question is what is missing in the prior art? Well here nothing is missing but what really turns out to be missing is that there's an additional element uh, that was in uh, the, the patent claim here, um, the clay patent claim, um, which was this sufficient aeration component, right? So the claim is up here on the screen, a blasting composition uh, consisting essentially of, and it has the list of ingredients, and at the very end it says sufficient aeration is entrapped to enhance sensitivity to a substantial degree. Right, so this is the missing element. None of the other two pieces of prior art, neither of one of those, included what appeared to be a reference to a sufficient aeration. Right? So what Clay says is 
my claim is therefore not anticipated because it fails the identity requirement. The prior art, both the Egley and Butterworth references, neither one of them have disclosed the sufficient aeration requirement, and therefore there can be no anticipation. Right? But that, as it turns out, is really not quite the end of the story because the question is, is it really missing from the prior art? Just the fact that they are not literally stating sufficient aeration in Egley and Butterworth does not end the inquiry. Right? And this is an important concept. And that's because the, the patent law includes the doctrine of inherency. Right? The idea here is that if the prior art necessarily functions in accordance with or includes the claim limitation, then it anticipates. Right? So what does that mean? Well, that means that the question isn't so much whether the question doesn't end when we decide that Egley and Butterworth don't directly state sufficient aeration, that instead we need to then inquire whether Egley and, and or Butterworth necessarily include uh, the sufficient aeration limitation because if they do then they do anticipate right so inherency can be pretty tough to get your head around and so um, let's talk about it a little bit and, and I think the easiest way to think about it is almost um, uh, as, a, as this diagram I have here where you have a core of a description right so you have a disclosure um, that explains something maybe it's a recipe maybe it's a, a picture um, and that includes what's in the gray area. That's the express description, what you read, what a person of ordinary skill in the art would read that to include. But every disclosure also includes a little more description, right? It includes a little more content. And that is the inherent content, right? That's the content, the disclosure that's there inherently, even if it doesn't say it's there, right? Um, and so the scope of the disclosure of, par, pr, of the prior art is a combination of both what is expressly described and what is inherently present or inherently described, right? So you need to consider both of these and combine these. The tricky question with inherency is how do you measure it? How do you figure out whether something is inherent in a particular description, right? And so the way that you measure it, and the standard I've got up here again, is that if the prior art necessarily functions in accordance with or includes the claim limitations it anticipates. So that's the question. Does the prior art necessarily include this extra content? Right? Does it incorporate it somehow? Does it necessarily include it? Now, does that mean that a person of ordinary skill in the art has to understand it? Right, that they have to read that express description and understand that that prior that that disclosure is there. The answer to that is no. Right, that the the inherency doctrine does not require that the prior art or the person of ordinary skill in the in the art reading the prior art would understand or recognize the limitation involved. Right, all it does is require that that the court find and this is a fact question. Uh, that the, uh, that the prior art necessarily functions with or includes the claimed limitations, right? So there is not a requirement uh, that, that a person of ordinary skill in the art need to understand or recognize in this uh, concept here, right? So this, this is logical, right? Because if, if we required a person of ordinary skill in the art to recognize the, the inherent description, then inherency wouldn't be any more than just description, right? Because if you read uh, a document and you can understand it, it, you know, the document will tell you not only the things that it says, but also all of the things that it, that it uh, raises in your mind. And because of that, um, inherency wouldn't be particularly meaningful, right? So instead, what it does is it adds disclosure by saying that anything that's necessarily present is also part of the prior art and therefore can be used uh, to reject a patent uh, for anticipation and indeed obviousness purposes. So one question to ask yourself is why might we have this sort of doctrine? Right? And I think the best way to understand the inherency doctrine is as follows. Right? If the public already gets the benefit of the claimed invention, then you shouldn't get a patent. Right? The patent is not novel and therefore, or the claim is not novel, and therefore you shouldn't get a patent for it. Um, this is true even if the public doesn't know how or why, right? So in terms of the case we're looking at now, if the prior art explosives materials 
already used the sufficient aeration uh, inherently, if that was naturally and inevitably a part of the way that they operated, then the public is already getting all the benefits of this later claimed invention. So why would we want to give them uh, the benefits uh, or, or the patent when we already have those benefits? We can use the prior art, which necessarily includes everything. Right? If, on the other hand, the prior art does not include, doesn't say it, doesn't include anything about sufficient aeration, then the public does not have the benefit of the current the, of the invention that we're considering, and we probably want to give them that patent assuming there's no other patentability problems, of course. Right? So I think that's the way to think about this, is it's really about trying to measure as accurately as we can what it is the public has access to at the time, and then determine from there whether novelty exists or not. And again, we won't give patents to things that aren't novel. All right, so that's inherency uh, and the basics of, of anticipation. Uh, so let's move on to known or used by others or uh, otherwise known as public use. Right? Again, our statute uh, on the left, uh, the invention was known or used by others. Um, and on the right, in public use. Uh, a couple of additional aspects I want to note to you. Uh, note that the old law, the one that we're currently operating under, uh, says it must be known or used by others in this country. Uh, that has been removed uh, from the new law. Uh, so the geographic limitation of the knowledge has has been eliminated. Lots of reasons for that. We can talk about that in class. Uh, and then this this other phrase, this otherwise available to the public, is new to the patent law. Um, and so just want to flag that for you. We don't really know because obviously no cases have come up using, uh, that would uh, interpret that language. My uh, strong guess is that they're going to use the same uh, set of criteria that they use for known or used by others for both public use or otherwise available to the public. Um, there's some uh, legislative history and statutory language suggesting that they're trying to codify existing law where possible. Um, so I suspect that, that most of the law we're going to talk about, the cases we're going to talk about uh, today are going to be directly applicable, but again, we don't know for sure. All right, so a case I had you do was the Gaylor uh, versus Wilder case. All right, so Wilder owns a patent on the application of plaster of Paris as an insulator in a fireproof safe. Uh, Wilder sells these under the uh, moniker salamander safes. If you Google salamander safes, there's lots of pictures of them out there. Um, basically, the idea here is that these uh, safes have two steel walls, and in between, in that void, you pour plaster of Paris. It makes this an, an insulating or fireproof safe. Um, and so Wilder sues Gaylor, Gaylor um, saying that, that Gaylor is... Um, uh, infringing the patent that Wilder owns. Uh, Gaylor defends uh, against uh, a claim, against Wilder's claim, by saying well, your patent is invalid for anticipation. Right? So this is a very common scenario that we're going to see all the time where uh, the patentee can sue um, and one of the defenses uh, to that patent infringement allegation is that the patent is invalid and therefore um, there, the, the lawsuit can't go forward. Uh, and so what Gaylor says is that, that although Wilder has this patent, that patent is indeed invalid because uh, a, a gentleman by the name of Connor made this safe um, uh, in a, a prior um, to the invention uh, of Wilder. And apparently, uh, as it turns out, um, Connor did make such a safe um, and was some kind of a shopkeeper, made this safe for himself to keep his own papers in. Um, he kept it secret. It was in a back room. He was the only one who ever used it. He didn't sell it, didn't demonstrate it to anybody. It just sort of existed there. And at some point, it got lost um, or uh, destroyed, and it's gone. All right? And the question is, is the Connor safe, is that earlier... Uh, prior um, safe and anticipatory reference that can be used against the, the current Wilder patent. Right? And the court says uh, that it is not. 
right? So the court uh, argues that, uh, that knowledge that has been abandoned or lost to the public is the same as knowledge which has never been discovered at all and that therefore Wilder is entitled to maintain uh, uh, his patent because uh, the, the prior disclosure was not in fact good prior art. Right, so it's an interesting question: Is this is it the right result? Right, because Wilder was clearly not um, the first person to invent this device. This was it appears that Connor was. Uh, on the other hand, it's Wilder that has done the work uh, and more recently made sure that to make the public disclosure, which after all is what the patent system is trying to do. Right, so what the court is trying to do here is balance these two things. On the one hand, we want to make sure we give the patent to the to the true and rightful first inventor. On the other hand, if the true and rightful first inventor um, uh, never commercialized, never told anybody, kept the whole thing secret, then it's hard to say that we shouldn't give it to the person who does do the work of bringing it forward to the public, even if it's a later date. And so that's how that plays out. So Rosaire versus Baroid is another case uh, relating to what, what it means to be known or used by others. Uh, these patents relate to methods of prospecting for oil or hydrocarbons, right? And the idea is uh, the Rosaire patents. Uh, and the, and the, uh, again, the defense is that these patents are anticipated, uh, and they are anticipated by something that Teplitz did, right? Uh, and so Teplitz, people, both parties seem to agree that Teplitz uh, conceived of the idea of extracting and measuring gas from samples of rock. Um, and he, he did, uh, the uh, Rosaire does not uh, dispute that, that that happened and that he was the first, that Teplitz was indeed the first one to do it, but Teplitz didn't do anything with it, right? Uh, that, that the company that Teplitz worked for um, had this idea, they kept it in their files, they sort of generally knew it existed, but they didn't apply for a patent for many, many years, um, and uh, they didn't do anything about it and they just uh, they didn't publish the ideas uh, and so the public had no benefit of any of these experiments that Teplitz had done uh, and that therefore this should not be an anticipating reference again under the Gaylor v. Wilder regime whereby if the knowledge has not been transmitted to the public uh, then uh, it is not an anticipating reference. Here though the court goes the other way right the court says that that the Teplitz reference can be uh, and anticipating public reference, that it is known or used by others, right? So why? Why do they go the other way? Was it publicly uh, disclosed? Well, it depends what you mean by public. Um, uh, it really wasn't given to the public at large, right? But the court makes a, a big deal about noting that it was indeed, however, um, not kept secret. Right? So although the public didn't necessarily know about it, there was nothing that, that Teplitz and the Gulf Oil Company was doing very much to keep it secret and that therefore because it was uh, part of the ordinary course of business um, and that they weren't trying to keep it secret, they weren't actively trying to suppress it uh, or get rid of the information, uh, that it is indeed um, something that has entered into the public consciousness and therefore is an anticipating reference. All right. So you can see sort of lining up the facts in these cases, the secret prior safe, the Gaylor versus Wilder, and the Rosaire case where there was sort of a limited set of field trials and experiments but not public ones, shows sort of two, how broadly the court has considered this known or used by others concept. Right? It, when we say public use, it probably doesn't mean public use in the ordinary sense of the word. It just means somebody other than the inventor needs to know it and it needs to be um, uh, non-secret, right? So again, in the, in the Rosaire case, this uh, usual course of business, right? So what we really mean by public is essentially non-secret use, okay? And you don't really need a public disclosure in the ordinary sense uh, under, under, under the law. All right, next. Uh, patented or described in a printed publication. All right. All right. Again, back to the statutory language. Old law on the left, new law on the right. Uh, you can see that here, uh, these two things track the language tracks pretty well. So I would expect that the law would pretty much uh, maintain the same here. Again, different dates. Right. Non-invention date. 
uh, after March 16th, it'll be the effective filing date, but the, the, the legal standard should be about the same. All right. So the Klopfenstein case, uh, the appellants presented a slide presentation uh, and uh, uh, pasted this onto poster boards uh, and at a uh, national society meeting for science. Uh, I guess it was for the um, American Association of Serial Chemists. Uh, and so uh, this is um, both parties agree that the reference that was presented there uh, and was on the posters disclosed all the limitations um, and there was not a disclaimer or a notice or anything pre preventing um, a, uh, anyone from taking notes or anything like that. So it was non-secret uh, in that sense and the question is, is this a printed publication uh, in the way that the statute uh, requires um, uh, a printed publication. All right. And what the court says here is that throughout our case law, public accessibility has been the criterion by which a prior art reference will be judged for purposes of 102B. Oftentimes, courts have found it helpful to rely on distribution and indexing as proxies for public accessibility. When they have done so, it has been to the exclusion of all other measures. In other words, it has not been to the exclusion. Distribution and indexing are not the only factors, right? So the fact that they didn't distribute the paper, the fact that the paper wasn't indexed, was not the end of the story in this case. Um, uh, what the court says in, in Klopfenstein is that if it's, it's, it's disclosed to the relevant public, uh, then it doesn't necessarily matter whether there's been a, a publication in the ordinary sense, that that disclosure to a relevant public can in, can in effect be a publication. Right? So the court describes the factors here. It's relevant that how much time uh, the display was exhibited how ex expert the target audience was, uh, the reasonable expectations that the material displayed could not be copied, the simplicity with which the material displayed could have been copied, uh, and, and they balance all these factors, right? So they, they use sort of a totality of the circumstances multi-factor test to determine that indeed in this case, given the context, uh, this was a, a prior publication and therefore prior art that was available for uh, an anticipatory reference, right? So in general, what the Klopfenstein cases stands for the proposition that a wide array of references, a wide array of information can be called printed publications, right? And here are some of the cases both in the, in the, uh, in the readings um, and in the notes that I had you read specifically. So Klopfenstein is a poster presentation, a conference. Hall was a thesis filed and indexed in a university library. That was a good publication, uh, or that was a printed publication because it was indexed by subject matter. Uh, and uh, uh, Cronin, on the other hand, was, was a, st a student's thesis that was presented, so it was publicly presented, but then it was essentially not indexed uh, and, and was law, well, not findable, and therefore the court thought since it was not findable after the fact, uh, it was not a printed publication, right? The MIT case dealt with a paper presentation and they actually distributed an early version of the paper at MIT uh, and that was uh, a printed publication. Wire said that an Australian patent application that was available only on microfilm and only at the Australian Patent Office was indeed a printed publication as well. Lister, on the other hand, goes the other way. Uh, a manuscript filed with the U.S. Copyright Office uh, is not a printed publication uh, because it's not searchable by subject matter. You could search it by the author uh, and maybe the title, uh, but you could not search by subject matter. It's not indexed by subject matter and therefore not accessible. Right. So the touchstone, as the court says over and over again, of what is a uh, is publicly accessible uh, is whether or not there's an ability for an interested researcher to find the information that's been requested. Right. All right. So the next question, uh, then, yeah, well, one question I want want you to go through on your own is to consider these possible scenarios. Right. So what about a model that's displayed in a private museum? Is that model a piece of prior art that can be used? Is that a printed publication? It's in a private museum. Uh, what does that mean? And what factors would be relevant to you? What about an email posted on to a public discussion list? Right. Is that a printed publication? 
What about specifications posted to a company intranet, right? An internal network, searchable, fully searchable, but only within the company, right? Is that a printed publication? What about one of our class discussions recorded and posted to YouTube? Is that a printed publication? Is that an anticipating reference? What factors would need to be considered? All right. So each of those I want you to consider uh, whether or not they would be printed publications. What this is, what the printed publication doctrine is about, is about trying to figure out the optimal amount of searching for the prior art. All right? I mean, consider two things. One, um, there are two ways that you could come up with a, a new innovation or some, some solution to a problem. One is to generate your own in, um, independent research, right? original research solving the problem. The second is you could search and search and search for um, somebody else who has solved the problem already some, uh, in, somewhere, somehow. Right? Now, both of those are ways of solving problems. Note that we um, uh, only give patents right, to number one, right, to the first, only for original research. Right? So one of the, a, pol a potential policy problem is that by giving patents only to original research, we're going to discourage people from doing searches of existing research in favor of doing new and original research and that is probably not efficient. What we want people to do is whenever possible search prior art instead of generating the costs or creating the costs that are required to make original research. Right? So that's one of the reasons we have a very strict novelty requirement. Right? Why we require, why we say that almost anything that's out there is a printed publication. Right? The idea here is if you can find it, then you shouldn't be able to get a patent for it. Right? If this topic, if this subject matter, if this claim can be found, then as a policy matter, we don't want to give the patent for it because it's probably cheaper to find it than it is to create new and original research and therefore more efficient to do the searching. So we're trying to, through a very strict novelty requirement here, through a requirement that, you, that, that almost everything that's out there that can be found is a, is a piece of prior art, it's telling people, it's encouraging people to use prior research um, uh, and to do prior research uh, instead of simply do original research and, and you know, effectively reinvent the wheel. All right, so the last little bit that I want to talk about here is secret prior art, right? Um, and there's really a couple of concepts here, right? And I'll explain why we call it secret prior art in a moment. So prior disclosures and patent applications. So here we've got um, uh, the statute again, and this is 102E on the left, right? Uh, 102E says the person shall be entitled to a patent unless the invention was described in one, an application for a patent, published, a published patent application uh, by another filed in the USA uh, before the invention uh, by the applicant, or to a patent granted on an application for a patent filed in the US before the invention thereof. Right? Now, the 102A2 of the new law has a roughly parallel structure here, which is you entitled to a patent unless the claimed invention was described in a patent issued or in an application for patent published or deemed published under 122 in which the patent or application names another inventor and was effectively filed before the effective filing date. Right? Again, the difference here, key difference here being the dates, the critical dates are different. Uh, on the old law, it's the invention date that's the key. Uh, new law, it's the uh, effective filing date. Right. So what does this mean? Well, let's work through this a little bit, right? So the Alexander Milburn case, there's really not a dispute here about whether, uh, about inventorship, right? The dispute here is that, that uh, whether, what's the effect of this earlier application, right? So this is a scenario where invention is disclosed earlier, but not claimed earlier, right? So why is this not a standard printed publication under the, the prior section 102A that we've talked about. Well, patent applications are not um, uh, published, right? And until uh, the mid-90s, they weren't published until they were granted, right? And so, and in any event, they aren't published immediately upon their filing date, 
right? So the reason that we have this 102E rule, this rule that says, um, and again, look back at it, says that um, you, uh, you cannot get a patent if your invention was described in an application um, filed before your invention, right? So what that is saying, uh, and, and the Alexander Milburn case deals with this quite well, it says that the delays of the patent office should not uh, cut down the effect of what has been done, right? If we didn't have the 102E rule, right, you would have the scenario where you can sort of see it a little bit better on this slide, right? So let's say A files um, a patent application, right, and uh, is granted or published in 1994, files in 1990. B files and B is granted, right, uh, a patent application. Now the problem is, let's say A and B cover the same material, right, so A is a, is a disclosure that would invalidate uh, patent B. Until A is either granted or published in 1994, there is no way for that reference, that A reference, to be used against B, right? So B would get away with something here. B would be able to get a patent on something uh, where she was not uh, the first, necessarily the first inventor, at least not the first filer, right? So really what this 102E rule does, or what this prior uh, disclosure in a pending application does, is allows you to backdate to the filing date, right? So when you look at what 102E says, it says the invention um, uh, is, uh, described in an application or in a patent granted on an application filed before the invention uh, of the patent applicant, right? So what that means is, is that 102E allows the A reference to have an effective uh, publication date of 1990, not 1994. Right, so it's a backdating provision. It says that the disclosure is of a patent application uh, is effective as of its filing date, not the date when it actually gets published, uh, whether it's published um, because all patents are published after 18 months or um, uh, published because it gets granted. Right, so that so that's the idea. Now, if you're B. And, and this happens, this happens to you, and they assert a the reference, a reference against you. What can you do? Right. Well, until well, March, until March 16, 2013, what you what you can do is is prove that the patent office that you invented prior prior to A's filing, filing date. Right. So right. if you so you invented invented first, first then A is a no longer on good good prior prior arts and can be against you. Against you. Against you. Right. Right. Now now why don't why you, don't you automatically, automatically tell the patent office that you, that you have invented, 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 invented first first part of what your data invention is? is? Well, well mainly for administrative simplicity. Right. right. We the, the law assumes um, that your filing date is your date of invention. You can file an affidavit known as a Rule 131 affidavit. Uh, showing uh, that you had an earlier date of invention than the date of your filing date, which obviously you almost always do since it takes time to prepare a patent application. Uh, and a, a Rule 131 declaration uh, requires you to, under oath, um, describe when you filed for the patent and, and uh, uh, when you, sorry, when you invented uh, the, the subject matter of the claims and how, right? All right. Now, that works until March 16th, right? However, um, after March 16th, uh, the new law kicks in, and then what do you do, right? You can't, you can't use the invention date anymore uh, because that's not the relevant date, right? The relevant date is the filing date. And so, well, the, the thing you can do after uh, March 16th is hope that you, the scenario fits into one of these exceptions. And we'll talk a little bit more about these exceptions in the next class, um, but there are basically three of them, right? One is um, the prior disclosure won't count if it was obtained directly or indirectly from the in inventor or a joint inventor. This is known as derivation, right? If somebody actually, you know, either stole or heard from you um, uh, your idea and then quickly uh, filed a patent on it, uh, that does not count against you as a as a uh, 
uh, prior art reference if you can prove that that happened. Um, B says that the subject matter had um, uh, been publicly disclosed by the joint inventor, right? So if, if before the potentially invalidating prior reference was filed, um, the, the inventor, uh, him or herself, actually disclosed things, then the prior art doesn't count, right? And we'll talk a little bit more about how this plays out later. And then finally, um, uh, if there was common ownership uh, between these two uh, inventions or, or applications, then they don't count against each other. All right, so those are the exceptions. That's the way to get around this, the effect of this rule um, uh, after March 16th, all right? So the other, the reason we call this, by the way, secret prior art is because it allows um, an earlier date. This backdating effect means that the prior art at the time, for much of the time during which it will be effective, is often secret, right? We won't really know what's in a patent application until it gets granted or published, but the publication date of that will be much earlier. All right, so the other con the other area of secret prior art I want to talk about briefly is prior inventive activity, and this only applies until March 16th, right? So what 102G2 says is that before such person's invention thereof, the invention was made in this country by another inventor who had not abandoned, suppressed, or concealed it. All right. So this is a fairly controversial interpretation of 102G that the court has uh, instilled over the last 15 years. And that is this idea that 102G is really about priority of invention, which we're going to talk about in class 8. Um, but instead of using it only for priority of invention, the court has essentially transformed it into a prior art section, right? So what it's saying here is that prior inventive activity can be prior art. This is the Thompson case that, that I had you look at. Um, that indeed 102G2 can be uh, prior art. So if you can find out that somebody was engaging in uh, inventive activity, had actually invented the same invention prior um, to the patent's invention date, and that invention was not uh, abandoned, suppressed, or concealed, then that can be prior art that can be used to invalidate as anticipating um, uh, the invention at issue. Right. Um, the book goes through this in some detail, but it does appear uh, to largely swallow a lot of the 102A provisions, right? in part because there's no requirement here um, of publication. Right? It doesn't require that anybody know about this, uh, for one thing, and, uh, and uh, it, it, it doesn't require, uh, it's not clear whether it requires sort of anticipatory enablement, um, uh, although it does require that you can't abandon, suppress, or conceal it. Um, so it's a little different, but it does appear to be a pretty important uh, aspect of uh, prior art. On the other hand, it's pretty rare that you would actually find this in the real world, right? I mean, because this would uh, mean that you would have to find a case where somebody had not disclosed that they were engaging in this activity, um, and yet they were inventing and never did anything about it, right? They didn't end up um, going and doing uh, a, a publication, probably, or because if it was an earlier publication, it would probably uh, end up being a, a prior publication bar rather than a prior inventive activity bar. Another way to think about this is this is a version of what uh, we now know as prior users' rights, right? That by saying that that it's a uh, that you can invalidate a patent claim by prior inventive activity, you're you're essentially giving people who've been working on this problem um, an earlier a defense uh, to patent infringement, right? And in fact, uh, the America Invents Act includes such a provision in Section 273, um, and we don't need to go through this in great detail, but uh, there is a fairly robust uh, prior user defense now where it's a defense to infringement claims if you have uh, prior to the filing date uh, of, uh, of a patent uh, engaged in using that method or in a manu or a composition uh, of matter in a manufacturing or commercial process 
um, uh, in, in the manners described in Section 273. Um, so this gives um, people have, the idea here is if you were, you had, for example, a manufacturing process that was a trade secret, that you've been keeping a trade secret, you were only using it in your manufacturing plant, and then all of a sudden somebody gets a patent on it uh, and tries to come after you, this gives you a defense. All right. Now note, importantly, this is a defense to infringement, this is not invalidation. Right, so it doesn't invalidate the patent that somebody might sue you on. What it does is it gives you a defense to infringement uh, for it. And so that's lecture five, uh, novelty one, and we'll pick this up in novelty two.